All right, everybody, I really don't have to introduce myself. I mean, this is a group of, uh, of course, uh, some friends, um, a lot of, uh, you know, agents that are within the uh, different offices that we have in our operations in Myrtle Beach, Columbia, and Charleston. And I'm just wanting to jump right into a, um, a conversation and introduce the, uh, a guest today. And, and you can see her right there, right in the front, right beside me. Um, her name is Jackie Jamelis. Did I get it right? That was perfect. I'm impressed. Jackie Jamelis. And, um, and Jackie is basically um, came from a friend of mine, a fellow um, a business owner, Century 21 owner in California named Neil Swartz, dear friend of mine, known him for many, many years. Um, some of you know who he is, um, but he runs an operation very similar to mine. And the reason I can say that is because we both have been following Mike Ferry for 20 plus years. Matter of fact, Neil may have been the first coaching client for Mike Ferry um, when it comes to one-on-one -on -one coaching clients. So he's, he, he beats me in longevity, um, um, but he's uh, definitely something that somebody that we have a lot of similarities with. So he introduced me, or through his daughter, I was introduced to Jackie. And um, so let me just say a few things, and then I'm going to let Jackie do the talking. Um, but through multiple texts and a conversation and then me kind of, you know, doing some research and, and whatnot on, on Jackie, I became very inspired. And, um, and everybody that's been around me, you've heard me say, you know, breakdowns are the access to breakthroughs. You know, for some of the ladies on the, on the call that have come to me and says, I need to talk and you came to me in tears and then I ended up smiling at you and kind of giggling. And then you looked at me a little twisted, like, what the hell are you doing that for? You know, I've got all this bad stuff going on in my life and you're sitting here kind of like smiling. And I'm like, man, the breakdown couldn't be any bigger. And what I'm really smiling about is like, that just means the breakthrough is going to be that big also. You know, and so for some reason through dialogues, Jackie, you brought that out of me. And I said, gosh, I just see you as this like, man, breakdown after breakdown, and, 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 and then you just kept going. So I'm very impressed, and I want to share that. For those of you that don't know, um, Jackie is currently a member of the Connecticut Sun. Is that right, Connecticut Sun? Which is yeah. uh, WNBA, um, uh, professional women's basketball, um, which is impressive. But you're also, you, it, I guess you went to St. Mary's High School is what, I, what I've researched in Stockton. Right, yeah. And, um, and Stockton is really close to where I was born, Turlock. My yeah, parents, I love that. My parents still have a home in, in, in Turlock, actually. But she was a basketball phenom. Mm -hmm. It looked like to me you were maybe the number one basketball rated basketball, a female basketball player coming out of high school. Heavily recruited for a fantastic school, University of Southern California. Now, I have to say that because if I say USC, we're Gamecocks over here. Yeah, you think and it's South probably, Carolina. <laughs> yeah, and, and the Gamecocks have a hell of a women's basketball team program right yeah, now. Yeah, they do. You know? So she goes to USC. There's a, some challenges. She plays. She doesn't play. She gets into the WNBA. She's kicked out. Not kicked out. Doesn't make it to the uh, to the starting rosters. No longer in the WNBA. Traveling all the world, all around the world, you know. Gets back into the WNBA. Gets out of the WNBA, and today she's back in the WNBA. I think I actually got that right. Yeah, uh, you did. Well said. The key is is uh, here's another thing I didn't say to you, Jackie. You remind me of this poster that is out there that has a Lincoln on it. In Abe Lincoln, in this poster, it actually states all of the failures that Abe Lincoln had. Now, right. whether they were, he made bad decisions or whether it, things just didn't go right, because I don't look at your, your story as failures, but it just for some reason, at the end of the poster, it then says he became the president. Mm -hmm. And like he had every reason to not move forward. And I believe people are going to hear today that you had those same things. You had every reason to not move forward, but you did. And, um, and, and I said to you in a text uh, a moment ago, and I'm going to actually pull the text because as you and I were chatting, it just came out of me. I said, 
This is my direct text to Jackie a, mo a moment ago. I just wrote this down as I'm thinking of you. We all have hero inside of us. All of us have hero inside of us. We just need to learn how to unleash it. And I feel like you've kind of found that. that but we got to understand, hero isn't based on the trophies. It's based on the triumph. And that's, you know, if I can ever say thank you for anything to you, Jackie, it's for you to actually have brought that out of me because I'll read that over and over again and be thinking about myself, be thinking about everyone on this call, be thinking about future agents and people that I'm dealing with to see if I can actually see the hero in them. So why don't you just, you know, give us a little bit or a lot of bit of your story, of your journey, and um, and then we'll just go in and kind of have a little question and answer session between me and you, and see if we can, you know, inspire the people that are are, are following the call today. Yeah. So m my story is really just a one big roller coaster. Um, it started. I started playing basketball when I was seven. Um, a big influence that I had growing up was my dad, who was a player. Um, he played at Weber State in Utah, um, and then he went on to play overseas in Athens, Greece. Um, so I think a lot of my influence to play the game started from my dad. Um, and he got me and my sister into the game of basketball when we were really young. Um, my sister's 16 months older than me, so I was the youngest sister. Um, and you know, for us being so close in age, she was always a little bit better than me at everything, uh, and basketball being one of those things. So naturally as the younger sister, I always wanted to be better than her. Um, I, I took a big passion for basketball, whether it was because my dad played it and I knew he wanted me to play it. I don't, I don't know what the reason was, but I was really into sports and particularly basketball at a really young age. Um. So in sixth grade, when my dad found the best coach in the area, um, a guy by the name of Tom Gonzalez, uh, he's known for being one of the craziest um, men's coaches in this area. And he was actually kicked out of the men's game because he was so crazy and they wouldn't allow him back uh, into the high school game to coach. So then he went to the girls' side. He just said, okay, you're not going to let me coach on the men's side. I'm going to coach on the women's side. So he started coaching his daughter. Um, it was a seventh and eighth grade AAU team. And my dad found out about this guy. So he took me and my sister to go try out because he wanted us to play for the best coach. Um, so my sister was in seventh grade at the time. I'm in sixth. And uh, Tom said to my dad, you know, I want Jonna, but I don't want Jackie. So I, I'll, take, I'll take John on the team, but I'm not going to take uh, the younger one, maybe next year. So pretty much my dad just begged Tom to let me have a spot on the team and to give me a jersey. He just said, she doesn't have to play. She just wants to be there and learn and try and get better. Um, so throughout that year, throughout that sixth grade year, I earned my way into the starting lineup. And it was just kind of a progression. It started from me not being very good to me just catching on and learning really, really fast when I was in sixth grade. So then I got, I got on that starting lineup. I was playing every game. I was just continually growing and getting better and better and better. Um, and then, you know, I was kind of reaching that point where I started to get better than my sister, Jonna. Um, and then that's when basketball got really serious because I knew that I had a big passion for it. And I knew my competitive spirit was so um, different than most girls at that age. And I think that my parents, especially my dad, instilled a huge work ethic in me when I was really young. Um, and then by the time I got into the seventh grade, uh, people started to say that I was the best seventh grader in my age group in Northern California. Um, and then in eighth grade, it became I was the best player in my grade in California. Um, and then it was time for us to choose what high school or me to choose what high school I was going to. And Tom Gonzalez, that coach that I had in sixth and seventh and eighth grade, um, he got the high school job at St. Mary's High School. Um, so that's, that was a no-brainer. I didn't want to go to St. Mary's because all of my friends were going to our rival school, Lincoln. But I, I chose to go to St. Mary's so that I would play for Tom Gonzalez. Uh, it was the best move for my career. Um, yeah, again, my parents were a big influence on that, but that ended up being the best decision I could have made. 
Um, my freshman year, I was declared the top five player in the country in my class. Um, I started at St. Mary's, a freshman on the varsity team. And, um, you know, my the way things happened, I just kept getting better and better and better every single year. And I think it was just the countless hours and time that I was putting into the game outside of practices. Um, because, you know, for me, practice with my team wasn't enough. And my dad was taking, <clears throat> my dad was taking me, you know, to practices all throughout California, um, you know, not getting very much sleep. Uh, he, he's always worked the graveyard shift at Food for Less. So his hours were in the middle of the night. He would go in at, uh, you know, 12 midnight, and then he would come home at eight o'clock in the morning. So he only had enough time to sleep for a few hours when he got home from work and then get up and deal with me and John after we got out of school. So he was constantly taking us to different practices throughout, you know, Northern California, didn't matter where it was, just everything that he sacrificed to get us to where we needed to be. It was, it was amazing. Um, and also during that time, my mom was battling breast cancer. Um, so she, she was in a, in a, you know, really tough position. She was, she did so well hiding that for me and my sister, how sick she was with the chemotherapy and the radiation and everything that was going on. Um, but I just think the sacrifice that both my parents made for me and my sisters during those times, during our upbringing was just huge. Um, and I think that that really set a fire inside of me um, to really want to be the best basketball player that I could be. So I, I think my work ethic was on a different level than most girls um, in high school at that time. After games, you know, I was in the gym for two or three hours. It didn't matter. Um, my trainer was in there just shooting with me every single day, um, trying, to, trying to get me to be the best player that I could be. Um, you know, I never wanted to practice as much as the other girls were practicing. I always wanted to practice more. Um, so throughout my high school career, I had a pretty magical high school career. Um, by the end of my senior year in high school, I was declared the number one player in the country. Um, and I think that I got to that point because of that work ethic that was instilled at me at such a young age and the passion and the love for the game. Um, and to fast forward my senior year in high school, the last game of my senior year in high school is when I went down and I tore my ACL for the first time. Um, so that was, that was two weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, that was two weeks before the McDonald's All-American game, um, which is a huge, a huge game. It's, you know, the top 20 high school players uh, in the country and they go and the East plays against the West. Um, it's just a big showcase once a year. They have 20 participants from the women's side and 20 from the men's side. Um, and in my, my class that year, Kevin Durant was the biggest name that was at, that was in San Diego for the McDonald's, um, all American game. So that was a pretty cool, pretty cool thing because he was our big name in that, in that year. Um, so I wasn't able to participate in that game, um, uh, because I had torn my ACL. So that was really devastating to me. Um, it was the first time I had ever been injured. First time I had ever gone through any, uh, sort of setback or injury like that in my career. I didn't know how to take it. I, you know, I'm a workhorse. I was always trying to work. I was always trying to outwork and do better than the other, the other player. But that was the first time I had to kind of sit down and just watch the game and be a spectator. Um, so I wasn't able to participate in that game. And then I also got a call from my coaches at USC telling me that I was going to have to redshirt my first year at USC. So I got all this information kind of in a very short amount of time. Um, and that was just such a devastating time for me because the game was taken away from me. Um, and then throughout my college career, I, again, um, for the next four years, I, I tore my ACL again consecutively for the next four years. So I didn't play my first college basketball game until my senior year um, in college. And I played, it was February 4th, 2010, which is almost the end of the season. So it was really like my first game, my senior year was pretty much at the end of the season. I played that game. I got through it. Um, the following year, which was my fifth year at USC, I got a full season in, healthy, injury-free. Um, and then my sixth year, because I had six years at USC, because I took a redshirt and a medical redshirt. 
um, I, I played that year and then I tore my ACL for the fifth time, um, December 19th, 2012, no, 2011. Um, so by that time, uh, it was December, the WNBA draft was in March. And here's a girl that's only played in 57 college games because I had been sidelined and injured and, um, you know, pretty much on the bench my whole entire college career after being the number one player in the country in high school. So I still had that name. That name kind of carried me throughout college, but a lot of people just counted me out because of everything that had been going on. And I, I couldn't get on the court. I couldn't stay on the court. Um, but God willing, or what, however you want to say it, um, my name was called in the third round, the 31st overall pick to the Minnesota Lynx. Um, and for me, that was just one more thing for me to hold on to and grab onto and just say, okay, I'm not going to quit. I was still drafted after all of this adversity. Um, this is going to be my motivation. I'm not done here. Um, and then that mindset kind of propelled me through the ups and downs of my professional career. Um, since that last tear, my sixth year in at USC, I've been injury free, I'm knocking on wood right now, um, for the last eight years now. Um, and my professional career has just been a roller coaster. Like I said, I've just battled getting cut from different WNBA, WNBA teams, but I also had the feeling of making the WNBA in 2015 with the Chicago sky, which was my ultimate dream and everything that I was playing toward and wanting to come back from. Um, and you know, there's so many different stories throughout that whole span that I just told you, but. Uh, that's kind of an overview of my career and what happened and kind of a chronological order from high school where I started, you know, I was the number one player in the country and then the devastating college career where I was just down and out and couldn't get back up. And then kind of that progression um, after college, getting drafted, getting cut, getting on a team, getting cut, getting cut, getting cut, but playing great overseas and making a name for myself over, overseas. Um, so it's just been, it's been a fun crazy road yeah it's been crazy so i something touched me really early this morning as i was reading an article and i think it was a newspaper article online out of chicago <clears throat> and you overheard your dad say something can you um can you tell us a little bit can you tell i i, I know what you i know what you overheard because i read it right assuming the article's um, accurate yeah, there's so many articles out there. I just want to make sure I, I know what you're saying. Okay, but I so think, you, I think over, I yeah, you got hurt. There was a time you got hurt and your dad okay, was talking on the phone and you overheard him something and he didn't mean for you to hear it. Yeah. Can you just share with, because you know, again, I, I, I'm going to, we're going to, we, we talk, I want to have a, a deeper conversation with you, but you know, this is very, very mm -hmm. impactful. I'm a father. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and, and I have, you know, children that play sports and, you know, and sometimes as a father, you know, we kind of feel their pains and we feel their, their joys. And it's like, you know, we try not, we try not to show our emotions. I mean, if we're, if we're, if we're a good <laughs> sport parent, you know, we try not to, we try to keep our emotions in the lines and, and, and whatnot, but it's also difficult, but you got hurt, you overheard your dad say something. And I want to tell us that. And then what did that mean for you? Like, where did you go with that? Was that a dark moment? Was that a dark moment that, that, that shed a light on another moment? But just what was your, th tell us what happened and what you were thinking. Yeah. So I had overheard my dad say, um, you know, basically it's time for Jackie to think about something else other than basketball. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's what you're referring to. Yeah, you know, you got over, hurt, and then he said, "I think she should quit, or I think it should should stop, or yeah, something like that." Yeah, um, and it was obviously something that I wasn't supposed to hear. Um, you know, throughout that time at USC, when I was getting injured over and over and over again, there were doctors, physical therapists, coaches, everyone around me was just urging me and, and telling me to stop playing basketball. My game wasn't fit and ready uh, you know to play basketball my knees weren't made for basketball um and it was just so devastating for me to hear something like that because here I am so determined to come back from this injury 
over and over and over again because this is my passion. This is what I love doing. This is what makes me feel good. Um, and then having all of these professionals and people around me telling me to stop playing, that it's not worth it, that by 40, I'm going to have to have knee replacements and I'm not going to be able to play with my kids in the future because I'm not going to be able to, you know, to be mobile. Um, you know, so many reasons why these people kept telling me stop. Um, and at one point, you know, I, I felt like, am I crazy? Am I crazy for continuing to go through these knee surgeries? You know, by now I'm 31 years old. I've had eight knee surgeries in total. Um, and five of those were, were really big surgeries. Um, but I think that what it was for me was when I heard my dad say that, when it was someone that I knew believed in me more than anyone believed in me, it, it hit different. It hit differently. And it was, it was so sad for me because I'm like, no, dad, you know, you're on my side. You, you're supposed to be on my side. Um, and that, that made me kind of break down a little bit. Um, and, and I just, I wanted my biggest supporter, my biggest fan to be on my side and to, and to do what I wanted to do. And I always thought that I had that from my parents, but you know, they were, they became scared. They became uh, worried. And, you know, even till this day, my dad can't watch me play anymore mm. just because he's so, he's so afraid that any movement or anything is going to happen. It's just going to tear me down again. Um, and like you said, you said, we try not to feel our kids. Um, you know, we try to, to be emotionally stable for our kids, but sometimes I think that parents and people that love each other so much, they feel everything that their loved one feels. Um, so it was like every time that I went down, it was like my parents went down too. They were in the same feeling as me. Um, and that did something for me. It really, it really opened my eyes. And, and I just said, you know what, I'm going to do this for him. I'm going to do this for my mom. I'm going to do this for them because I know I can, I know I can make the WNBA. I know everything that they put into it. Um, and I got them to get back on my side again. Um, and it was just like, you know, how, how do you tell your kid no when all they want to do is just have, they have a dream and they just want to see it happen. Um, so they got back on board after talking with me about it and crying. We were crying together. We were sharing our emotions together. Um, but I just told them, look, you guys aren't going to, you guys aren't going to, uh, you know, be able to tell me to stop. Like my story ends when I'm ready for it to end. Um, and so that's kind of how that conversation went. That's all. And I'm sure your dad was being a protector, right, at that point. And, Absolutely. And, and he's probably been protecting you all his life, protecting you from bad coaches, protecting you from this, protecting you from that, protecting you from, uh, I don't know, any kind of scouts that might be trying to uh, get you to sign. You know, I mean, he, he's your protector. Right. And at some point, I'm sure it kicked in where it's like, you know, maybe my job as a father right now is to protect my daughter. And this is, and this is what, how it showed up for him. So I yeah. can totally get what he was probably thinking. Um, but how, you know, but you, you just, it sounds like you turn, you, 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 you internalize that, you took that and, and then you allowed that to kind of build you up and keep you going. I'm sure it wasn't easy, you know, right. um, but it's something that you did. So, you, you know, again, you had every reason to quit. You had doctors saying, you're, you know, look, you keep going and you might be in a wheelchair. I don't know that they said that, but no, they did, I, could imagine, absolutely. I could imagine that somebody would say that. Right. And um, and then you have a, a father that's trying to protect you. And, 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 and a lot of people don't quit because they want to they don't want to uh, they don't want it to to appear as if they're quitters. But, you know, there's there. I think there's a time where, you know, maybe it's OK to stop. Um, um, and that's not necessarily being a quitter, you know, and I feel like you were presented with that. Um, mm -hmm. you touched on it a little bit more, but at those dark moments, you know, I, you know, you don't see that Jackie's got a lot of, she's got a lot of tattoos. Okay. <laughs> you can't see yeah. it on the, on the camera. And I yeah. said, I bet you, you got a story for every one of those tattoos. And, 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 and I, I, and, and I would assume that, not every story was a positive story when you, when, when you first formulated, I'm going to get this as a tattoo. But the key is, is like when you were at those moments where, well, first of all, did you ever feel like quitting? Did you ever, did, did, was quitting ever, was, was it ever an option for you? I would say it was temporarily. Yeah. Um, 
but you know, I think it was more of like this tunnel vision that I had and it was this goal of being in the WNBA. Um, and that that's the best league in the world for women's basketball. It's the top 144 players to ever play the game. They're in this league. Um, and I knew that I was on that stage, that I was in that group. Um, and I was supposed to be at the top of that group before getting injured. So it was just this feeling and this tunnel vision of, I want to be in the WNBA. It was a dream that I had in 1996 when the WNBA started, when I was a little girl. Um, you know, I was at a Monarchs game, a Sacramento Monarchs game. Um, and I got picked out of all the people in the arena. There was thousands and thousands of people in the arena. And they picked me and my dad to go out at halftime and shoot. You had to make six free throws in less than a minute. Um, and I went out there. I missed the first one. And then the next six were just swish, swish, swish. And I had the whole crowd, like, cheering for me and clapping for me. And it was just amazing. And for me, it was just like, from that moment on, I said, I belong on this floor. This is the stage I belong on. Um, so it's these moments and these things that, um, that, that I had with me that, that propelled me to want to keep going and fight for that dream and fight for that, that goal. Um, of course, I had moments where I wanted to quit, low moments when I wanted to quit. I was so exhausted with having to go through the surgery and the rehab, doing the same things over and over again, having to sit out, um, having to be on crutches for the first month having to go through that pain. Um, of course, I didn't want to go through that, but I knew that I, that's what I had to get through um, in order to, to get what I wanted. And uh, I always felt too, at the time when I was injuring myself, I felt I was young enough and capable enough to go through it and still be able to do it. Because I was so afraid of feeling like if I were to quit, will one day I regret quitting? And that is something that I never wanted to experience. I always hear older people um, around me say, you know, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. And that is the one thing I'm so afraid of. I don't want to say, you know, I wish I would have done this uh, in my life. And um, that's why I think that I just, I just kept going. And, and I just said, okay, I'll give myself these one or two days to sulk and to feel sorry for myself and to entertain the thought of quitting. Um, but that just, you know, I always snapped out of it so fast. And I think it was just, I was talking to Allison this morning. I think it was just a tunnel vision um, of a dream and a goal. And, uh, and that was that. Well, and what, so, so what, what was the goal? Maybe, maybe let me start there. And then, you know, I like to peel the onion a little bit deeper, but what was the, the goal? How would you articulate your goal? Was it, I wanted to be on the, in the WNBA. Was that it? Is, was it was it money? Was it fame? Was it uh, what? What was the actual goal that you would have said? Uh, it was it was definitely to be in the WNBA and to be considered one of the best basketball players in the world because I knew that's where I was supposed to be. I knew that's what um, I was before injury, um, yeah. and I didn't want to let these injuries prevent me from being that. Um, and, and maybe it was for fame a little bit because. In the women's basketball world, I was famous. Um, you know, women's basketball is a small, small circle. But in that world of it, um, you know, I guess you could say I was famous. And then I, and then I started to be known for the girl that kept tearing her ACL. The number one player, the number one player in the country. Um, poor, poor girl. She just can't get back on the court. She's the girl that tore her ACL. So I wanted to get out of that. I didn't want to be the girl that keeps tearing her ACL. I wanted to be the girl that was able to come back from five ACL tears and still make the WNBA and still make her dreams come true. Um, so it was just this, um, this passion and this fire that I had inside of me that I wanted to get on that stage and prove every single person wrong that ever thought that I wasn't going to be able to do it. So was your goal being in the WNBA or was your goal proving everybody wrong? Both. both. It was, it was both because um, I, I knew my passion. I knew what made me, what made me feel good. Um, I also, you know, and I think, yeah, it, it partially had to do with wanting to prove everyone want, wrong, but also wanting to um, show my parents, make my parents proud. Mm. You know, it was just a number of things that I had all these reasons why I, I wanted to hold on. 
And a huge reason of it was I want, you know, my parents to see me come out of that, come out of that tunnel uh, wearing a WNBA jersey because that's, you know, they put so much time and, and money and effort and, um, and everything into that for me and my sisters growing up. Um, to, to really just excel in anything that we did. And I, you know, I, I saw how much it meant to my dad and how proud my dad was of me. Um, it was, we were just living in a dream world in high school, you know. Um, everywhere we went, people would start whispering and talking about, you know, me. Or, um, and it was just, we, we just loved it, you know. And it was just a part of us. It was a part of who I was when I was young. I wanted that back. Yeah, so I, I, I think there's a lot of us, you know, on the call, and, and, and there's a diverse little group here. A majority of the people are my agents, but um, uh, my daughter's on here who played, you know, plays tennis, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, but I also invited her, all the other girls and kids that's, that are still playing in the tennis academy that she played in before she went off to college. Okay. And so you, you've got some young tennis players anywhere from possibly the age of, 13 up to maybe, you know, 15 also listening to you right now. And I, you know, I wanted to invite them to this call, awesome. you know, because I can, you know, being a, a parent that, you know, spent a lot of time on the, on the sideline of the tennis courts, you know, I can relate to a lot of what you and your father, you and your father surely have done, you know, gone a lot further than, than the, you know, than most people, but I can kind of relate to the stories, Absolutely. you know, but I think a lot of, you know, what I'm trying to get at, Jackie, is I think a lot of us have goals of getting in the WNBA, which mean, means we have a goal of like, I want to make 100 sales. I want to get into the WNBA. I want to be into, I want to be in um, a, a collegiate tennis player. I want to be a professional golfer. We all like state our goals in ways that everyone in the world as soon as we say it, they get it. Oh, okay, your goal is the WNBA. But what I've learned is that's, that's just the way that we articulate our goal in a way that everyone could understand within one sentence. Mm -hmm. But I, also, I never think that that's really like the ultimate goal. I think that there's something else that we're going for. So like what I, my question for you is this, is like, I know that was the goal, and we talked about proving, you know, people, uh, you know, wrong, and not from a negative standpoint. You wanted to to be that hero, I think, in your own mind. Um, right. But you've done those things. I would think that you've reached some of those goals. So, so as you sit on the, uh, you know, and and you reflect and you look at your journey and you say, okay, I did achieve those things. What did you really achieve? What did you really get by fighting through all this, by, by overcoming, by not quitting? What, what did you really get from this? What did you really achieve besides the WNBA? I think um, the impact that I've had on other athletes and other, other players that have gone through big injuries like this, um, you know, a lot throughout the time in college when I was tearing my ACL and continuing to get injured. <clears throat> I was getting a lot of emails and messages from other players, um, whether it was parents of other players, whether it was other girls or other, other little boys. Um, you know, I've read your story and it's so inspirational to me. I just tore my ACL, um, but seeing that you've came back from three or four or whatever it was at the time, <clears throat> you know, your story really inspired me. And I was, I was getting these messages so often. People were seeing the articles that ESPN was putting out or Sports Illustrated or whatever it was. And I just sort of became this, um, this icon of like, um, you know, the girl that keeps standing up. The stand, you know, the, the quote, uh, fall seven times, stand up eight. And I was kind of, I started to become this kind of like role model for, for people and for um, other athletes. And I think that I, I wanted, I, I started to buy into that and I started to buy into the fact that, okay, maybe I'm not the number one player in the country anymore. Maybe I'm not going to be, you know, <clears throat> the next Diana Taurasi, but what I was going to do was I was going to be um, the example that people don't have to give up when they hurt themselves. 
or no matter how many times you fall, you can still get up. And I really, I really bought into that. And I really started to feel a passion for that. Like, I don't want to let these other people down. I want to show them and be that example for them that you can still do it. Um, so I think even at this point in my career, after everything and after having the, um, you know, the high of making that WNBA, but also the lows of getting cut from so many other teams, um, the work ethic that I put into this game and the dedication and the time, um, it's just an example of um, a fighter, you know, and, and it's weird to label myself all these things because I'm just sitting here talking about myself and just saying I'm all these great things. But, um, you know, it's, I, I am an example for, for a lot of other athletes. And I think that that really has um, just completely got me to this point and wanting me to keep going and not quit. Uh, so I don't know if, if that makes any sense to you, mm-hmm. um, but it, it's just kind of another avenue of, of why. Yeah. I, and so that's what I'm gathering. So my interpretation of, of, of what you're sharing and, and it, and it just, I just, saw, I just saw a connection between you sharing it now and then you hinting towards it um, um, in, a, in, in some additional information that you shared earlier in the call is, you know, you, you, that term, I wanted to prove people wrong. A lot of people could hear that and say, oh, like, who are you to be proven making people wrong? I know that's not the, that's not the dialogue, but it, 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 it almost sounds like at some point you, you took it upon yourself that you, that you somehow, whether you, it, it just came to you or you, you, you decided you were going to take the responsibility of being an inspiration for others. It's right. like, it, it, exactly. like if you would have quit, I'm imagining if you would have quit, yes, you and your dad would have cried and then y'all would have got over it and you guys would have started some other hobby. Okay, right. I get that. But if you would have quit, I think you started to real. and I'm putting words in your mouth, so please, I want no, you to no. back on this. Um, yeah. I, I feel like you were quitting. If you would have quit, you would have quit on, you would have gave other people permission to quit. Right. Like if you would have quit, you would have given other person, you know, other, uh, other people permission to quit. And you didn't want to give people permission to quit. I mean, that's yeah. what I'm hearing from you. It was, it was just like, um, you know, I, I wanted to, to be, to be that example. I wanted, I wanted to, uh, you know, for the longest time, I didn't accept that I was the girl that kept tearing their ACL. Okay, I didn't want to accept that. I wanted to accept being the number one player in the country. That's what I was feeding for. That's what I wanted. But as time went on and I was seeing all the uh, lives I was impacting through what was going on, I finally just said, okay, this is the road that I am on. This is, this, these are the cards that I had been dealt with. And I just completely bought into it. And I just said, okay, I'm going to be an inspiration. I'm go- it's bigger than basketball. You know, it was bigger than the game of basketball. It was, it it became something else. It became so much more. And I was so excited to kind of buy into that and have a different passion and have a new passion. Um, You know, my passion wasn't just playing basketball that was lighting me up. It was helping other people see that they can still do it no matter what. Um, You you know, and, and that, and that is what I really grabbed onto. And that is really the new me, so to speak. And that's also why I started, um, you know, we'll probably get into that at some point, but I, I started a clothing line and I, I named it Overcome. Um, and it's all pertains to overcoming adversity. And I'm able to inspire people through a clothing line and things that I have felt and things that I have felt along the way. Uh, and, it's, and it's the easiest way for me to be able to share that message because I'm a basketball player and I'm moving from country to country, state to state. Um, to have an online kind of business, but, um, you know, just really wanting to be that inspiration and that uh, message for, for people uh, that I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, so, so I love it, you know, it's, it's bigger than the game and, and I've created something that I, that I love and I have that, that feeling for outside of playing. Yeah. When I looked at your clothing, the, the, the website, um, I, I was very attracted to that term overcome. Yeah, it, kind of, it really fit your story. 
right? So yeah. that was cool. I, you know, I take notes a lot of times when I'm doing these things. And something that I took note here about, you know, it, it, that you brought to my attention is what happens today doesn't dictate your future. How you respond to what happens today dictates your future. It's like the ACL, it, that didn't, the terror, the, the mini terrors, the, 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 the issues that you had with that, it didn't, when you, when you tore your ACL that day, that didn't necessarily dictate the future. It's how you responded. You could have responded more of like, okay, maybe I need to go in and start to, you know, another career path. Right. Or you responded with, I'm just going to have to work a little bit harder, right? It was the right. response that dictated your future. So for those of us that are experiencing some sort of breakdown today, whether we're having a breakdown in our personal relationships or we're having a breakdown on the tennis court, our forehands just not clicking, or, or, or whether we've got deals falling through or people saying no, it's like none of that is going to set the path that you're gonna be on. None of that's going to actually di dictate you know, your future. What's going to dictate our future is how do we respond when our forehand's not actually, you know, on point today? How do we respond when we're, you know, got an ACL turn, uh, tear? How do we respond to a deal falling through or a customer that's not listening or, or, or a relationship that's just not uh, healthy today? How are we responding to that is what's going to dictate our, our, our future. Would you, would you agree and share those thoughts? Or? Yeah, well, well said. I mean, that's exactly what it is, you, you know like you said, tearing my ACL, it wasn't going to be the end game for me. It was the mindset that I had after the response that I had after. And that was always, um, you know, ha the way I responded was giving myself a couple days to feel sorry for myself and to sulk and to cry. Um, but it was the immediate feeling after of, okay, it's time to get back up. It's time to move forward you know, and it's time to do this all over again. And, and for me, my dad always said to me, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Um, and I had to really focus on that and not look at the, at the future. If I, if I were to, to sit there and say, okay, the next 12 months, eight to 12 months is going to be just awful. I'm going to have to go through this rehab again, this pain, this agony, this depression, you know, I'm going to have to sit here and go through this again. I was going to, you know, mentally just destroy myself. Um, so every day for me, it was, it was a new day. Um, and, and I always, I always carried my, you know, carried with me that, that feeling, that end game. And that end game was putting on that WNBA jersey. Um, so I woke up with a passion no matter what, because I knew what I was working toward. I knew there was something inside me that was just ready to just unleash and get in that league. So it was every day. It wasn't, you know, an end game. And it was always um, just that focus that I had and that mindset after the breakdown. Um, and, and, you know, I love what you said to me, the breakdowns create breakthroughs. And I think that's truly uh, how things played out for me it was every breakdown I had, somehow it formed into a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I made a shirt um, for everyone that's listening. I made a shirt because of Greg um, that says, you know, breakdowns equal breakthroughs, because that's, that was everything for me. That was my exact feeling that I had, for, you know, for everything that happened. Yeah. You know, I'm going, that, that's cool. So going back uh, to something you said, you, you, you've, you've talked about work ethic. Okay. And I, I just assume you probably had good work ethic from conversations we've had. Um, but what I really became apparent uh, about you is you, you have to have this amazing, strong, mental uh, mindset you've got you, you you must be very strong mentally but i think you know there's people out there that have good work ethic and maybe their mindset is not that strong and then there's people that have strong mindsets and they don't have good work ethic and and right. I, I think it's a combination of of the two that that when combined we can create extraordinary things Right. You know, that's where extraordinary comes from is when we combine the mental toughness as well as the, 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 the work ethic. And in real estate, you know, I try to, to coach my agents to be like athletes. And, you know, like 
for instance, if like what if you're playing in a WNBA game, what is the normal tip off time for WNBA? It's like four in the afternoon. Is that right? What, okay. Yeah. And so can you take us through your routine on game day? If tip off time is four, four o'clock or four fifteen, whatever time that is, can you take us through your routine? What is, yeah. what is it? When does your day start for a four o'clock tip off time? Well, it all starts the day before, the night before, the preparation the day before the game um, and staying off your feet as much as possible, not walking around, not doing anything extra, going to the mall, going, you know, ha if a practice is usually more light the day before a game um, and the dinner the night before the game, a lot of carbs, a lot of protein, mm -hmm. um, a good night's rest, of course going to sleep at a, at a good, a good hour, not staying up too late. Um, waking up for a good breakfast, not waking up too late, not waking up, you know, too early. Um, putting, putting good nutrients and stuff in, into the body um, for the game to perform at the highest levels. Um, usually there's a shoot around practice uh, before four o'clock game probably around 11 o'clock. We'll go to um, walk through the other team's plays, um, mentally prepare ourselves for the opponent, um, get some shots up, you know, just repetition things, um, go back, uh, eat lunch, take a nap, maybe if that's what you do. I know personally, I like naps. I always take a nap before a game. Um, coming in to the game two hours prior before the game, um, prior to the game, and, um, you know, usually for me, it's I have music on. I'm listening to something, not really talking to other people, very focused on what I'm doing. We always have um, a scout report for the other team. So going over the scout report, knowing the plays, knowing the personnel from the other team. Um, basketball is not just about playing five on five and playing the game. It's also very, um, very much using your head and knowing what the other team is doing and the tendencies from the other, other team and the schemes from the other team. So being prepared mentally for that um, is, is a huge advantage. Um, so going through the scout, um, going out for shoot around, pregame shoot around, stretching, um, taping your ankles, you know, doing all these things that uh, usually most of us do. I definitely do. I have a certain, um, you know, certain exercises that I do for my knees so that I'm, my knees are strong and ready for the game. Um, and then game time, you know, that's, it, it's a, it's a huge process. It's a long process. A game isn't just for that day. It starts the day before, sometimes even two days before, you know, you're in the back of your mind, you're like, okay, we have a game on Saturday. It's, it's Thursday right now. So it's, you don't want to put your body through too much. You have to really rest it and really stay off your feet so that you're, able to give 100% in that game. Mm. Yeah. So like for so game time for a real estate agent is when we go on an appointment. Mm -hmm. You know, or game time could be if you're going to generate listing uh generate business in the morning, eight o'clock is our tip off time. You know, right. so you know, I you know, I feel the same thing is we need to we need to figure out what our pregame routine is so we can be sharp. Like like if you don't follow your your pregame routine um, how does that affect your play? Yeah, I mean, it affects huge. Um, everything is kind of routine. You know, you you have a routine as, as a basketball player, and you stick to that routine. And I'm very superstitious, so if I don't stick to that routine, you know, I'm going to somehow psych myself out and say, okay, I'm going to play bad if I don't do it this way. Or if, you know, this is the chair that I sat in the last time we won here, I have to sit in this chair. Uh, you know, so very, um, it's very serious, the routine and the preparation. If anything goes wrong, it's, you know, for someone like me, it's mentally disturbing. Um, it gets in my way of my performance and how I want to perform. And um, so I do everything by routine. There's no way I'm going to go outside of that. And if I do, uh, you know, I'm mentally going to block something. I'm just mentally, something's going to be off and it's going to, affect my affect how I perform um so I think that any little thing really um really can hinder you from from playing at your best and I think that 
that's why it's so, you know, as professional athletes, as world-class athletes, we give ourselves that um, preparation for a reason because we know that's what is going to have us perform at the highest levels. Yeah. And would you say that's fairly common amongst the other players, at least the, the greater players? Absolutely. You know, you can tell the difference between a professional um, and, and from a college player or a high school player. There's a huge difference. We all have our routines. We all have our things that we have to do. You know, everyone's different, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, but everyone has to go by what they do. So they play at their highest. And it's, and it's kind of cool when you walk into a locker room with a bunch of different girls on a team and you see how everyone is preparing themselves. Um, you know, some people like to be goofy and dance and, and loosen up that way. Some people like to be to themselves, like to go over the scout and like to have music in their ears. Some people, you know, they're not affected. They just walk around and they're just as if it's another day. Um, you know, everyone is different, but I think that we all um, share a common interest in that preparation and that mindset. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Well, th this has all been fantastic stuff and we're kind of winding down, you know, getting close to the hour here. And, yeah. um, you know, a few, uh, another thing that I, I wrote down, um, you know, and, and as, as, as you were talking is for those of us that have goals, right. Um, and in, in order to reach those goals and to like those really crazy, outrageous, like almost impossible type of things I wrote down, your desire has to burn hotter than the pain that you're going through. Like, you, like the desire to achieve what it is you want to achieve, achieve, that has to be burning hotter than the pain that you have to go through. And again, right. you know, I say this because all I'm doing is like putting my words on your story, um, you know, in, 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 in a way for me to kind of absorb and, and understand for myself, like how to apply some of these things. So, you know, I, I tell you, you've done some amazing things. And, you know, back to what I said about all of us have hero inside of us. When I said that in the beginning, and I'll, I'll kind of share at the end the same thing, what I want you to take or what I can share with you that I've taken from this conversation and this brief relationship that I've had with Jackie is that we all have hero inside of us. And, but, but it's not the hero that the spectator is going to see. It's the hero of like, I overcame. Interesting. You said overcome, like that's, that's your line, right? Is you've got yeah. these t-shirts that to me overcoming that is the hero. Right. And you know, Let's face it, Jackie, anytime we have a group of people, whether it be in the stands, on a Zoom call, or anywhere else, there are people that are suffering and wondering, should they quit? There are people that are wondering, can they do it? Like, there's no way that there's not people on this call right now that are not having those same questions. Um, not trying to put you on the spot, but anything that you can think of that you might tell somebody that's in that situation right now? Because I'm sure you get asked that. You said parents call you or email you and people say, how did you get through it? Like, what's some final advice you could give for people that are maybe at that wall wondering, should I quit? Should I move forward? Can I do this? Should I change my goal? Any thoughts? It, it kind of reminds me of one of the tattoos that I have since you did, you did bring up my tattoos earlier. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the most meaningful tattoo that I have is um, I put it underneath my scar um, on my knee. And I put, the quote is, it's the magic of risking everything for a dream that nobody sees but you. Um, and, and the way that I really, um, you know, perceived this quote was, this is, that quote was everything that I felt um through these things and i felt like i was alone especially after you know i heard my overheard my dad say those things um and it was just that's right right after that is when i got this this tattoo um and i just think that 
if you have a goal or a dream or anything like that, um, and you know, you're pushed to the limit of, of not being able to do it for whatever reason, if something happens, um, you know, I think risking everything for something that you want and something that you desire, um, it, it's everything. And, um, you know, f- the message that I want to share with people is just, um, if you have a passion in life, and for most people on this call, it's probably real estate, some tennis players. If you have a passion for something, um, you know, nothing can get in the way of wanting uh, to do great at that. And, you know, not everybody is, is fortunate enough to be doing something that they love and to be doing something that makes them feel the way basketball makes me feel. But hoping that a lot of the people on this call um, do have that passion for what they want and what they're doing. Um, you know, there's always going to be adversity. Um, everyone's going to go through adversity. Everyone's going to go through those hardships and those times where you just don't want to, don't want to do it. You don't think you can do it. But I think finding something, always being able to find something to grab a hold to and grab onto, uh, to keep that, to keep it going and to keep fighting and to keep pushing through, um, you, you can always find the silver lining, you know, and that's what that breakdown creates breakthroughs um kind of comes back into my mind um there's always something good that comes out of the bad and i think if you just have that mindset that positive mindset to just find that no matter where it is um you know you can you can hold on to it and push through so i don't know i hope that i hope that kind of um resonated with people i'm not sure but it just reminded me of my tattoo that i had um so yeah can you say the quote again yeah it's the magic of risking everything for a dream that nobody sees but you. And I'm a very emotional person. I obviously I wear my emotions on my body. I tattoo everything on my body. That's just who I am. Um, but usually it's something that I feel something that really, really moves me. And my mom always says she hates my tattoos. Well, she likes them now. But she always says, why don't you just write them down in a journal? Why do you have to put them on your body, you know? And uh, we've battled with my tattoos. Like, she just hated them at first. But then now it's just a part of who I am. And I think it's just funny how how that all happened. But (laughs) That is so cool. Well, well, Jackie, I tell you, um, I I have enjoyed, you know, um, getting to know you. And and I'm I'm making a commitment to continue – to get to know you better and better, no matter whether or not you want to or not. No, I definitely do. <laughs> I'm going to make that happen. Um, but I just want to say thank you because, uh, you know, you've, I, I, I think you're in a position, um, you have the ability and your story and the delivery, you can really touch people and you can move people. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and I think, you know, usually when we say, oh, we're going to have a professional or an athlete, we're thinking a male athlete. Now, unfortunately, like right. that's when you look at speakers and these conversations. So it was, it's even more rewarding just to, you know, to hear what you as a, as, as a woman has went through and, and, and how you've just overcame it. It's, it's very inspiring. I'm sure people got a lot from this. I will share feedback with you that they give with uh, give me, um, and I'll use a lot of your information in, um, you know, as future coaching dialogues with my my agents to try to emulate some of the things that you did that you took to overcome and to break through. I'll try to share and hold people accountable to those things, and and Thank of you, course. Greg. And, and, and of course, I probably have to be held. They'll, they'll hold me accountable too. <laughs> uh, for the few guys that are on here that, you know, the Duke, I can see this guy, Duke Melton. I, I whipped him and everyone else in a free throw, uh, free throw shooting contest. That's a matter of <laughs> fact, Duke's really mad right now because he actually beat me by one. Um, I think he was nine out of 10 and I was eight out of 10, but that's a big deal, I guess, when we're talking about one and only 10. <laughs> so Duke, I challenged Jackie. And, um, and then she kind of blew me off on the whole free throw thing. And she went straight through, straight to, why don't we just do three pointers? That was before I started watching her videos. 
And I, I started watching her videos. I, now, we'll stick to free throws because you can watch those three-pointers. I yeah. can, you have no – you got a nice little crossover, and then, bam, shoot that, that, that three-pointer. It looks really good. So, that, yeah. you, thank you so much for playing the game with me. We'll continue Absolutely. the conversation. Oh, by the way, what is the uh, website for the, uh, for, the, for the clothes, for the, sh the shirts and stuff? It's um, www.overcomebrand um dot store envy dot com i mean i can send it to you it's kind of a, yeah. it's a long a well send long. it to me because i'm probably i'm going to put this recording on my podcast if you're okay with that we'll talk about that again but i can also put links on it and of and, course and yeah it's published so for those of you that attended today's call thank you so much thank you jackie um you, and we'll talk again soon yeah and thanks to everyone for listening absolutely all right, all right. thank you bye-bye